Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's stand this morning. Let's bow our hearts to the Lord. Father, I know you have something on your heart and on your mind today, and we want to know that, Lord God. So, Lord, we pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that, Father, as we come into your presence to worship and praise, to give you thanks, Lord God, that you would touch our hearts and our lives, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that, Father, your will, your will today, Lord God, and we surrender ourselves to you, God, holy, Lord. We ask that you bless your people, Lord, like only you can, Lord. And so thank, you, thank you, God, for all the things you've already done. Thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. 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 Brothers and sisters, good morning. I hope everyone here is a child of the King. If not, this is your day. Amen. So, as his children, let's sing of his mercies today and forever. Amen. And in the, in the word of God, the, the word love and mercy are sometimes interchangeable. So, the first line of the song says, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. <clears throat> we'll proclaim his mercies. Amen. children take a minute and share his love with someone
my comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hand. Forever I love you, forever I stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hand. Forever I love you, forever I stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. In. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power praise to the king mountains bow down and the sea will roar at the sound of your name i sing for joy at the work of your hand forever i love you forever i'll stand nothing compared to the promise i have in Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Father, we want to thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord. And Father, every moment with you is special. Every moment with you is important, God. And you have many things to say to us, Lord, that will prepare us, God, that will equip us, that will strengthen us, Lord. And we know that it's done through the Word of God. So we pray, Lord, that you give us a teaching heart, a teachable heart, Lord, a heart to receive your Word, God, a heart that expects from you. We pray for the blessing, Father, of your spirit to be upon the word of God today, Lord God. Father, glorify yourself through the word. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. You're going to need a Bible today if you don't have one. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll give you a Bible. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Starting in verse 17. Acts chapter 20. Tell me when you're there. 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 Are you all there? Okay. 
Hold on for a second. Look at me. Jesus in the scripture, the gospels, he teaches that he's out there doing miracle after miracle after miracle. There are so many miracles he's doing, so many healings he's doing to his people that it, it's blowing people's mind. But when he gets to Nazareth, the Bible says he couldn't do hardly any miracles. He couldn't do anything in the people that he loved and he desired to do these things. And the Bible teaches that the reason why he couldn't do them is because of their unbelief. So Jesus had a following at this time, a great following of people he had healed and many people realized who he was. But the people that he went to in Nazareth rejected him and they questioned him. And they didn't believe that he could do it. They didn't bring their people to him so he could be, they could be healed. The Bible teaches that God honors faith. As a young man, as a young Christian, I remember coming to God every Sunday, every Wednesday night, Every time I went to the Bible, I believed that God was going to speak to me some way or another, that God was going to reveal himself to me. How many remember doing this? Okay, Lord. Did any of you do that? Raise your hand if you ever did that. Okay. When did you stop? <laughs> now, I'm not saying that we know the scripture. We should, shouldn't have to do that. But by faith, we did that many times as children. And God did speak to us many times. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to stir your faith this morning. I'm trying to get you to believe that God has something in mind for you today. Last week, my grand, one of my granddaughters came up. And she spent the weekend with us, with uh, my son and his, my other, grand, my grandson. And um, she has it made in the shade. She's, her parents, she got good parents and a good home, and she's really blessed. But this is what she said when she's getting ready to leave. I want to live here from now on, Grandma. Well, let me explain to you why she said, I want to live there myself if my wife would treat me the way she treats my grandchildren. She makes cookies with them, she draws with them, she spends time with them, she does everything you can think of with them. You name it, she does it. My granddaughter knows that she is blessed. But what about God? I cannot tell you how God wants to bless you. I can't explain it to you. I just know God's heart. He wants to bless you. But blessings are received by faith in God. One of the things I've learned from God is to expect from God. And as Christians, sometimes we stop expecting from God like he's changed. He hasn't. But God doesn't want us to enter into his house or into anything he calls you to do, whatever it may be, with unbelief. I don't believe you, God. God wants you to believe. So my point is, you need to expect from God. Before we go into the book of Acts, let me read something to you real quick to remind you. This is in 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, and it's a New Living Translation. It says this, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and it teaches us to do what is right. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipping for every good thing God wants us to do. 
What an awesome scripture. Let's get into our teaching this morning. Paul leaves Ephesus after three years and a great revival. Many come to Jesus and their lives are changing. And in coming to Jesus, they would live differently. Some would have to change their occupation, being silversmiths and making idols of the, the goddess Diana, or Diana. And they would have to leave the worship of Diana and worship the only true God, Jehovah. So when Jesus came into their lives, everything changed around these people in Ephesus. Everything. Now Paul leaves Ephesus and he's going out to other churches to encourage and to teach them. Paul is on a time schedule. He's left Philippi and after Passover and he wants to be in Jerusalem by Pentecost. He's already traveled some 350 miles in 24 days and has only 26 days left to travel the remaining 650 miles. So he lands in Miletus, which is about 30 miles away. While in Miletus, Paul will give a long message until midnight. One young man will fall asleep and fall three stories and be, they will die, literally. And the scripture teaches that Paul puts himself on him, prays, and he comes back to life. And many are encouraged by this, which I can see why. But Paul was a man of long sermons. They say for about six hours he taught. Now you think I'm long-winded. Makes me feel a little bit better. And that's where we are with Paul. And Paul goes on in verse 17 as he says this. From Miletius, he sent to Ephesus and he called for the elders of the church. So Paul calls for the elders of the church in Ephesus. He's about, like I said, 30 miles away. He brings them up to this place called Miletus, and he begins to speak to them. And really, this is really a farewell speech, so to say, or a sermon, to remind them of what they need to do and how they're to be. Paul believes that this is the last time he's going to see the Ephesians, and whom he loves. He's been there for three years, like I shared earlier. But now he needs to say goodbye to them. In verse 18, he goes on and he says, And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. So Paul, Paul begins to speak to them of his example in the way that he lived with them. Paul the apostle lived a very godly life. He was able to be be able to say that you be followers of me as I am of Jesus Christ. Paul's example was centered around Jesus as a perfect example. Well, this morning I want to, on this part of the scripture, want to teach you and remind you or encourage you about what it means to be an example. Now, every single one of you in this room is an example. Let me read you what the word means. A person or a thing to be imitated, a model or a pattern, precedent. You set an example to behave so as to be a pattern or a model for others to imitate. How many of you see your children are your children in you? How many see that? None of you? My children are like me in a lot of mannerisms. As you get older and you look back at your children, you see a lot of things that they do exactly in what you do. Even some of the sayings you say. They got that because they seen you in the way that you live and you're the greatest example that they have. Paul speaks to these Ephesians constantly telling them to follow his example. In the book of 1 Corinthians 11, 1, this is what it says, and Paul is speaking here, be you followers of me even as I am also of Christ. 
Now I want to turn to you to turn with me to the book of Thessalonians, chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. Paul again is speaking here about being an example. Tell me when you're there. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 9. I haven't heard any theirs yet. Okay. <laughs> but you yourself know how you ought to follow our example because we also did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. Both labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we might not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have the right to do this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you, that you might follow our example. Paul gave a wonderful example for those he ministered to and those he discipled. What he taught, he lived. The example is so important, beloved. The saying, don't do what I do, but do what I say, is not going to get your children to follow Christ or follow Jesus. Only as we become living examples of Jesus will they become like Christ. There's so much value in the demonstration of truth living out of the eyes of the beholder. People learn more readily what they see than what they hear. Your life should be a reflection of your teaching we teach a love in Calvary Chapel more probably than any other subject. We teach about Jesus, but we teach about love. And the first thought that comes to my mind when I think about love and what God wants to be, me to be an example is 1 Corinthians 13. And you all know it very well, don't you? Love is patient, love is kind, never haughty or envious. Love never holds a grudge, hardly ever notices when others are wrong, do it wrong. Love does not demand its own way. Love never fails. That's what God desires for us to live. As Christians, the greatest character of Christ is love. And we're to be examples of it. Now I'm gonna say this, we all fail at times. But the Holy Spirit convicts us. Yesterday I was driving, I had went and got some rock because I'm build, building a French drain in the backyard, it's kind of flooding. And so and there's a lady in front of me, I've got the gravel, it's starting to rain, I'm thinking I want to get this done before I get all rained on. And there's a lady in front of me and the stop, stop lights are green, she stops, looks around, looks around, looks around, and I'm going, come on, lady, come on. And I'm not saying anything really, but as time goes on, in about another 10 or 15 seconds, he's still sitting on the green light. And I want to remind you of something. God always puts people in our lives for the reason. After I had said, come on, woman, she got out of the way. It flashed on me in my mind. God put that woman for a reason in front of you. See how impatient you are? And I'm usually pretty patient, but I failed on that one for sure. And my son looked at me like, Dad. I didn't have to say one word. Bad example. Bad example. Now, I know none of you have done that this week or this month, only me. But your life should be a reflection of your teaching, and mine should be. Someone said, I would not give much for your religion unless it came, I can be seen or I can see it. Lamps do not talk, but they do shine. 
Years ago, the communist government in China commissioned an author to write a biography of Hudson Taylor with the purpose of distorting the facts and presenting him in a bad light. They wanted to discredit the name of the consecrated missionary of the gospel. As the author was doing his research, he was increasingly impressed by Taylor's saintly character and godly life, and he found it extremely difficult to carry out his assigned task with a clear conscience. Eventually, at the risk of losing his life, he set aside his pen, renounced atheism, and received Jesus as his personal savior. Whether we realize it or not, our example leaves an impression on others. So let me ask this question to you. How has your example been before God and others this week? Now, I don't want you to feel condemned in any way, neither does God. But God does want you, if your example has not been good, in front of your children, or your, your co-workers, or whoever it may be, God wants to convict you this morning, without a doubt. It's like he convicted me yesterday. So how is your example before God and others? If you say not good, then there's something I need to do about that. The Bible teaches I must do two things, confess and repent concerning that. Proverbs tells me this, a man who covers his sins will not prosper. But he who confesses them and forsakes them, God will have mercy on. And we all need to do that on a regular basis. Now, Paul continues in verse 19. And listen to what he says. He says, this is what he's doing. He's serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful but he proclaimed it, I proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So at the beginning of these scriptures, Paul speaks, and he begins to speak about him serving the Lord. This speaks of Paul, but it also speaks of all pastors and all leaders of the church or in the church or in the body of Christ. This is a concept we must keep in our minds. I'm not here to please men. I should not look to men for the rewards of my service. I should not look to men for direction for my service, but to God then my serving the Lord involves serving men or serving people. God has commanded me to love and to give as an elder. We have several elders in our church. This is something that should be in every Christian, but especially in every elder. It says here that Paul served with humility. Let me read this word humility, and we're not going to stay on it very long. But I think it's an important point that we need to be reminded every single day. The word literally means a deep sense of one's own moral littlenessness, or littleness. It means modesty or humility, lowliness of mind. The world and the flesh teach us totally opposite of how we're to be. And God makes a statement here, and probably one of the greatest men in the New Testament that God used acknowledges how he learned and what God taught him concerning being a servant. That he had to serve God in the right heart, in the right mind, in the sense of being in humility. Now this is one area we must be careful to watch out for our ministry. People look at the work God is doing through us and then he can start giving you credit for what God's doing. Only God can save a soul. 
Only God can speak to you and change your heart. Only God can give you understanding and knowledge and wisdom. Only God. But God uses vessels that are humble. Now the Lord has a way of humbling us all. What a tragedy when ministers or leaders start to get haughty. They become too important for individuals. I want to read a couple of scriptures to you. You don't have to look them up, but listen to them because they're important. Philippians 2, 3 says, Nothing should be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. In Colossians 2, 18, it says, Let no one cheat you of your reward. Take delight in false humility and worship of angels, including into those things which have not seen, vainly puffed up by the fleshly mind. Colossians 3.12 says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, and long-suffering. This next statement, I'm asking you to listen, and listen well, because it's very important. A man who really has seen God and has encountered God like each of us as Christians can. Is humble because he sees himself. Now, my point is this. When you get into the presence of God, when you get into the place of God's right there and you're right there and you're honest before God, God reveals yourself, not to condemn you. Not to say, look, you're a bad person. That is not what God does in any way. But what God will do is he will show you yourself so you won't think highly of yourself. And you'll be able to really put yourself in the place of death, of dying to self. They say that a man who is proud has not been in the presence of God. That's possibly true. God wants us to be men and women that are humble before God. Paul makes this statement as he goes on with many tears. Paul weeped over others who were suffering and those who had failed. Paul had been dealing with the situation of immorality among the Corinthians. He had written some strong words, even delivering the offenders over to Satan in 1 Corinthians 5. But what we don't often realize is that they were tempered with tears. Listen to what 2 Corinthians says in chapter 2, verse 4. And Paul is speaking here about what he was dealing with. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. God wants us to have tender hearts for others and toward others. An example of a tough but tender man was seen when Barbara Walters interviewed real-life hero Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf, the four-star general who led the Allied forces of the Desert Storm to their Gulf War victory over Iraq. As this tough military man talked about the war, tears were in his eyes. The interviewer noticed, too, and in her classic style, Barbara Walters asked, Why, General, aren't you afraid to cry? General Schwarzkopf replied, without hesitation, no, Barbara, I'm afraid of a man who won't cry. This great man knows that being tough doesn't mean being insensitive or unfeeling or afraid to cry. No wonder soldiers gave their best when they served under his command. They knew the general cared about them. They could trust the man giving the orders. We want leaders whose hearts can be touched by our own situations and touch our hearts as well. Amen? Now, Paul makes this statement as he continues, and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. 
In other words, imagine this. You're a Jew. You find the Messiah. You start sharing the gospel. And so there are other Jews who decide they're going to plot against you because you are sharing the gospel, are sharing the good news. And they're going to try to kill you. But Paul continues, even though these are the things that he faces in life, he continues to serve the Lord in trials. Now raise your hand if you've gone through a trial in the last month. Every one of you have, including myself. I'm always glad when trials are over because I love the results of what the trial brought into my life, the changes that it's made. But I don't like trials. I just like the results. Paul's trials came from the Jews. And again, I say, it was probably people that he grew up with, even maybe family members, that were plotting against him. When writing to the Corinthians, Paul had hinted at the same troubles he had had at times in Ephesus. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 15, 32 says. He talked about the fighting beasts of Ephesus, which may have been a reference to these unbelieving Jews. In 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9, he said that God had opened a great door for ministry at Ephesus, but there were also many adversaries. Now, you would think a person that is doing good and trying to help others, all would speak well of. Many times, this is not the case. I want you to notice what else Paul says. My car is beeping. That's not what Paul says. But <laughs> he says, I have kept back nothing that was helpful, but I have proclaimed it to you. I want to read this word to you in the original Greek. It means to be unwilling to utter from fear. It means to shrink from declaring, to conceal, or to dissemble. Paul was not afraid to tell the people what they needed to hear. He wasn't afraid of the response of losing them as friends. Let me say this, as a pastor, telling someone the truth is not always easy. I don't know if you realize that. There are people who have come into my office and they've asked me, Pastor, what does God say about divorce? And my question is, do you really want to know? Because many times people come into council and they want to hear what they want to hear. And if they don't hear what they want to hear, then they walk out of the office or either mad or upset or I don't see them anymore. So my thought is always, do you really want to hear? And usually what I will say to them if they ask me about a divorce, I say, God says that you want a divorce because your heart is hard now. That's the reason. There are people who come into my office and ask me, Pastor, what did God say about pot? And I ask them the same thing. Do you really want to know? Because I know you're a pothead. Because that's the people who ask me. I'm sorry. And then I give them some information. Usually, a 16-year-old kid came in the other day, and he asked me. And I say to him, science says this. It does brain damage. You don't mature like you should normally, according to science. Science says it leads to the stronger drug as it goes on. And I know what it, the law says. It's legal. They can buy it. But God says different. It's funny how God says the opposite of what many things man says is okay and legal. So Paul said things that were not easy, but they were true. Do you have a hard time at times hearing what is uncomfortable or convicts you? 
There's two things you can do. Lord, help me to accept this. Because I know what your word says now, God. Or you can get angry and say, no. The problem is that causes those things sometimes is literally we have people or we ourselves are involved. I can't tell you how many times I've read articles about pornography in the church. How many people are investing God's money into pornography? It's sad to see. I can't tell you how many times people bring homosexuality into the church. God says it's an abomination to him. That's why he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Transgenderism. God created man and woman, two sexes. And it's an abomination to God to say, you know what, he made a mistake. I, I was really born a man, but I, I'm a woman. It's an abomination to God. And beloved, there are many churches who are not saying one thing and inviting that in and accepting that. It's against God. And those people who get involved in that are not Christians, I'm sorry. So there's going to be some things that Paul says, they're helpful, they're profitable, they're expedient for you to listen and to hear, but they're hard at times. Could you imagine Paul saying, you know, I'm not going to get on that subject. I don't want to offend or hurt anybody's feelings. At the same time, offending and hurting God. Is that truly what a pastor or our leaders to do? There's a way we're supposed to do it, with love and with kindness, but always with the truth. Paul taught them house to house, and what he taught them is testifying to the Jews and also the Greeks that repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus. So Paul literally taught them about Jesus and having faith in Christ and that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. I'm sure he taught them how to walk with him. But he also taught them about repentance, a changing of one's mind and appearance to one who repents and the purpose that is formed or of something he has done, a turning away of true repentance, realizing that the person is wrong at times in their direction and God's direction is always right. He goes on in verse 22 and he says, And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing that there will, what will happen to me, except that the Holy Spirit testifies every, in every city, saying that chains and tribulation await me. Now, how would you like to be Paul at this point? You're doing everything God wants you to do. You're God's man. You've been obedient. You're filled with the Spirit of God. You're sold out 100%. And God says, uh, I just want to let you know. Change await you. You're going to be in prison, Paul. Tribulation, trials await you. When I look at things like this, I know that this is God's plan for Paul. And it'll work out just the way that God has foreordained it. Yes, it's God's perfect plan. What Paul goes through and the suffering that Paul goes through, God will use him in every single area that he goes, even in prison. Many of the guards that are strapped to Paul's arms will become Christians. I personally believe this happens in every Christian's life. Things will happen as we follow God's will that are unpleasant, that we don't understand. But God is in complete control. Amen? What about today in our world? 
everything seems to be going the opposite of God. What they call good, they call evil. What is good, they call evil. What is evil, they call good. The things that are happening today, God said that they would be like this. He called them birth pangs. And God is in control of all that is happening. It's not out of control. It looks like it, but God is doing his will. God is in complete control. And he's in control of your life if you'll let him be. We look at stories of men like Joseph. We all know what Joseph went through. Had this dream. that his brothers would bow down to him and his father would bow down to him and his mother would bow down to him. And it did come to pass. But it came to pass after many different trials, prison, being lied about. About 17 years of tribulation Joseph went through that God allowed and then God's perfect will happened during that time and after that time, God's perfect will happened. God was completely in control of Joseph being sold, being falsely accused, and God used it for good in Joseph's life. Same thing with Paul's, verse 24, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus, who testified the gospel of the grace of God. Now, this is a very strong point Paul speaks to us about. In his own personal life, he uses this to strengthen our life. It says, but none of these things move me or lead me out. That's what the word means. In other words, nothing moved me away from God's perfect will and his plan for my life. I stayed in the perfect will of God through this trial. So what did he do that caused him not to be moved from the purpose of God? The Bible says he did not count his life dear to him. In other words, he didn't count his own life that important. It wasn't the most important thing. Paul figured to live is Christ and to die is to gain. That's how Paul lived. He spoke of his desire to depart and to be with Christ, which was far better. It was also for the sakes of that he saw the Lord keeping him around. But he always visited heaven for a short, he already visited heaven for a short period of time and was anxious to go back. So you need to look at me for a second. What kind of trial would it take to move you away from God's plan and God's purpose? Or to stop you from doing what God has called you to do? For some, it might be a divorce, or it might be a death. It might be prison, or a loss of a child, a loss of health. So you must be very careful about not moving from the purpose of God, no matter what happens in our life. There's going to be things in the days that we live, beloved, that are going to happen in your life that is not explainable. But there's an antidote, the Word of God, and here it is. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Then Paul makes his statement, so that I will finish my race with joy. Paul was anxious to finish his course with joy. He looked at life as a race. He was running to win. 
He wrote that many may enter the race, but only one receives the first prize. He encouraged them to run to win. He was willing to lay aside every weight that might slow him down. The goal of the race was heaven. The prize was a high calling of God in Christ Jesus, the joy of dwelling in his presence and his kingdom forever. When Paul was approaching his martyrdom, he would be beheaded by Nero. He wrote to Timothy this, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness that the Lord our God, judge, a righteous judge, shall give, not only to me, but also to them who love his appearing. Sometimes we get tired of the race, don't we? But to finish the race, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus, who set the example to follow in, first, or in Hebrews chapter 12. Let me read it to you. Verses 1, 2, 3. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your heart. Beloved, when you became a Christian, you entered into the race, a race that are runners run and run and run. There are to be no spectators, judges, or cheerleaders. All of us are in a race. Now, in this verse, the last part of it, it says, in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of grace. Paul had received the ministry from God and what he is calling was to go to the, to the Gentiles mainly. That would be you and I and share the gospel of grace. I want to remind you what grace is. Unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor from God. It is a gift from God it has nothing to do with the, giver, the one receiving the gift. It's just received by faith in God. God. The gospel is one of grace. Now, Paul was called to do this ministry, to go to the Gentiles, and he did go to the Gentiles. He went all over and shared the gospel. But the Bible teaches also that God has given to each of us as a Christian the ministry of the gospel of grace. I am concerned about my children's salvation. They're saved, but as they were younger, that was my first thought, to teach them the ways of God. By example, through the scriptures, Teach them what it meant to have a relationship with Christ. That was my first ministry. My wife, my children, sharing the gospel. After I shared the gospel with my children, I shared the gospel with my brothers, my sisters. Then I went forth and began to share the gospel with friends, neighbors. I still, this, this week, got to share the gospel with several people. I'm always open. I'm trying to be open with it. This is a ministry that God has given to me. This is a ministry God has given to you as a Christian. Are you doing that ministry? Raise your hand if you're going to heaven. Amen. That's good. Every one of you are going to be in heaven. Who do you want to take along with you? Oh, I want everybody to come along with me, Pastor. You know how I am. I want everybody to come along with me. I want my neighbors to be there. And 
they're only going to be there as you share the gospel. My children are only going to be there because I did share the gospel. They responded to it. God wants us to share the gospel, period. I want to share a short story, and then we'll go on. You never know what God's going to do. You just don't know it. I went into Mendo Mill the other day, and so I asked a man there who worked there, I said, where is your, this tool or this thing that I need? Do you know where it's at? And he goes, yes, aisle 18. Let's go, follow me. So he was limping, and he looked really like, oh, my gosh, I'm in so much pain. And I said to him, did you hurt yourself? You know, what, what's wrong? He goes, it's been like this years. It kills me. I can barely walk. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And so he got up and he reached the thing and he handed it to me and he gave it to me. And I said, thank you. And I walked away. And when I'm walking away, the Lord spoke to me. He said, turn around and I want you to lay hands and pray for him. I'm three steps away. And I know what you probably think, well, pastor, you got to automatically obey God. Well, duh. But I did turn around, I did lay hands on them and pray for my ass first of all, because you want to always do that. God, I mean, sir, can I pray for you? And he said, yeah, sure, pray for me. But he thought that I was saying, I'll pray for you sometime down the road. So I said to him, I want to lay hands on and pray for you right now. And he looked at me like, and he's about six foot two and he's about 300 pounds. Okay. We were in the aisle alone, so I lay hands on him. I began to pray for him and asking God to touch his heart, first of all. And then I asked God to heal him. And then I said, okay, see you later, bye. And off I went. Now, I don't know what God did. But I knew the Holy Spirit spoke to me without a doubt. I want you to do this. Now, God's going to speak to you the same way. If you think that, well, pastors, you know, when God speaks like that, that's a bunch of baloney. God will speak to you today about something he wants you to do. It might be in the store. It might be, I don't know where it'd be. But let me ask you this question. Would you be willing if God said to you, I want you to share me with someone. I want you to stop and pray for this person. I want you to open your wallet and give a dollar to whatever. Would you be willing to do that? When you first accepted Christ, you were more than willing. I'll do anything, God. I'm sold out to you. Now, I think through maybe unbelief, what can happen is we stop hearing or listening to what God will tell us to do. Now, we're almost done. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. When you're there, let me know. Need to have a few more there's before we go on. Let me read verse 25 to you before we go into Ezekiel. And indeed, now, I know that you all, on whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare you the whole counsel of God. Now let's read Ezekiel 3, verse 17, because this is where Paul is teaching on the same verse. It's about a watchman, and it says, Son of man, 
I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel, therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning for me, from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou give him no warning, nor speaks to warn the wicked from their wicked way, to save his life. The same wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will be, I will require of your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but, has delivered, but thou hast delivered thy soul. These are pretty heavy verses, aren't they? To think that the blood of others might be required of us if we do not warn them. Paul is declaring that he's done this in his part. He's given them plenty of warning. He is free from their blood. Many today who believe in the Bible say that we are headed for the Great Tribulation. It will be the worst time in the history of mankind. It will be the judgment of God. If you want to learn about it, read. And we went through Revelations already. Read chapters 6 through 19. God's judgment will happen upon this world. Then there'll be the judgment, the great white throne judgment, where all will be judged before God who have died. And they'll stand before God and be judged and condemned to hell. If I warn people, then I'm free from their blood. Every one of us are to warn different people. But if not, the Bible teaches literally that their blood is on our hands. So what was Paul saying? He said, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I've shared the gospel. I've given you the full counsel of God. Everything that God has told me to tell you, I've told you. I've held nothing back, not a thing. Now he goes on and we'll end this teaching. Paul warns the elders, the leaders. Verse 28, therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseer, to shepherd the church of God with purchase with his own blood. For I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock also. From among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn you every night, with day and, night and day with tears. So Paul speaks to these elders and warns them. To remember what you're supposed to do concerning the sheep that God has given you. The Bible says here that the Holy Spirit made them overseers. Let me read this word to you, because sometimes I don't think people have a, a concept of what a pastor or a leader is to be concerning the church. They are never to control your life. They are to lead you by the scripture. An overseer means this, a man charged with the duty of seeing the things to be done by others and are done rightly a guardian or a superintendent. They are to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased. The word shepherd literally means to cherish as one's body, to serve the body, to supply the requisites for the soul that's needed, to furnish, to pasture for food. So that's what a shepherd's supposed to be. Now, Paul says, therefore, I know that after my departure, salvage wolves will come among you, not sparing the flock. And this did happen. Paul knew and prophesied that this would happen, and it did. Let me share with you what these words mean. It's important. Savage wolves. Savage, stern, cruel, violent, unsparing, abusive leaders will come. There'll be wolves, destructive men. Paul says this of speaking of false teachers, 
Men will bring in heresy, a false teaching, literally. And they'll speak perverse things. The word means to distort, to oppose, plot against, and saving the purpose and the plans of God. To turn aside from the right path, to pervert or to corrupt. Paul tells them to watch. The word means to give attention, to be cautious, to be alert. Paul warns them with tears because he has compassion for the people. There are some people who warn, but not with compassion. Let me share this story with you. We're almost completely done. It's called the ice cream prayer. A mom writes, last week I took my children to a restaurant. My six-year-old asked if he could say grace. As we bowed our head, he said, God is good, God is great. Thank you for the food. And when I would even be more thankful if mom gets ice cream for dessert. <laughs> and liberty and justice for all, amen. <laughs> He's a six-year-old without a doubt. <laughs> Along with the laughter from the other customers, nearby I heard a woman remark, that's what's wrong with this country. Kids today don't even know how to pray. Asking God for ice cream. I've asked God for different things like this. Why, I never. Hearing this, my son burst into tears and asked me, did I do it wrong? Is God mad at me? I, as I held him and I assured him that he had done a terrific job and God was certainly not mad at him, an elderly gentleman approached the table. He winked at my son and he said, I happen to know that God thought that was a great prayer. Really, my son asked, Cross my heart. Then a the in a theatrical whisper, he added, indicating the woman who remarks had started this whole thing. Too bad she never asked God for ice cream. A little ice cream is good for the soul sometimes. Naturally, I bought my kid ice cream at the end of the meal. My son stared at her for a moment and then did something I'll remember the rest of my life. He picked up his Sunday and without a word walked over, placed it in front of the woman. With a big smile, he told her, here, this is for you. Ice cream is good for the soul. Sometimes my soul, my soul is good already. I think we ought to be a whole lot less like this woman who felt it necessary to correct the little boy. I think we probably ought to be a whole lot more like a little boy have compassion on people. And Paul ends this. So now, brethren, verse 32, I commend you to God, or I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. So literally, this is something that you and I need to remember. It's important. Paul's leaving them. He's been there for three years. They are his children, so to say, and he loves them. He's told them the truth. He's prepared them. But now he has to take his hands off them. Now he's got to let them go. In other words, release them to God. Every one of us have people in our lives, like our children, our grandchildren, that we have to release them to God. Probably one of the hardest things is when people's children leave to go off to college. I know with my oldest son, he has two, two children, both of them go to college, and when they both left, he had entry, empty home syndrome, or house syndrome, or empty syndrome of some kind, and it was hard for them, really hard. They're still having a hard time. But here comes a release. As we commit them to God and we lay them in God's hand and we pray with them, we entrust God to order their steps and take care of them. That's so important. I can't tell you how important that is. 
There are things you have no control over. You have to let go and let God. And this is more or less what Paul does. His example for us is wonderful. And he ends his teaching with, and I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourself know that these hands have provided for my necessities. And for those who were with me, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, that he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that he would, they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. So let's just recap just for one second. Examples speak louder than words, don't they? And God wants you to be a godly example. If you're not, you need to ask God to help you change in that. It's so important, beloved. Paul was given the gospel of grace to share, and so are we. Every one of us are called to share the gospel. Beware of false teachers, Paul said. And what he really said is, he put it on the shepherds to make sure you're leading them, you're teaching them, you're taking care of them. Commit things to God and people to God that you have no control over anymore. And last but not least, you've ended a race. You've ended a race and everyone has to run. If you put yourself on the side of a race, you need to get back in the race. No spectators, that's important. Let's bow our hearts this morning. Father, there are many things that you do as many things that you teach us, Lord, as many things that you speak to us, Lord God. And everything you say to us, everything you teach us, Lord God, is because you love us, Lord. We are your children. And Father, as we apply these things to our life, you equip us by the Holy Spirit. You enable us, Lord God. And then you bless our lives because of it, Lord God. It's a win-win situation. So we want to thank you for that, Lord God, today. Thank you for what you've done. We pray that we would hold tight to what you've spoken to us today and that, Father, it produce the fruit in us that you desire, Lord God. Father, I want to pray that you would make us the godly examples and we'd be able to say, like Paul said, to follow me as I follow Christ. And Father, forgive us where we fail you, where we miss the mark. Father, we want you to be glorified through our lives. So do that through us, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Let us stand this morning. Maybe you've never accepted Christ. We want to share the gospel just like Paul said, that God sent him to share the gospel of grace. Real simple, you must believe Jesus came down from heaven, that he died and that he rose. You must believe you're a sinner. You must God, ask God to forgive you your sins and you must ask Christ to come into your heart and live. The Bible says you're born again. God makes a promise, he'll come and he'll receive you, but your life will never be the same, amen? Never. So if you haven't done that, do that today. We have pastors up here, and we have, I think, Tony's up here, too. If you need prayer, we'd like to get prayed for. If you're sick, you need anointing, we'd love to anoint you with oil, like the Bible says in the book of James. So please feel free to do that. If you want to come to the altar this morning and kneel down and pray or talk to God while the worship team plays, please do. May God richly bless you, and may you expect from God every day of your life because God desires to bless you. That's your dad.
Jesus, Lord of heaven. I do not deserve the grace that you have given or the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you made. Mercy beyond measure, my debt you freely paid. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heaven reaches. The stars in the sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, Lord of heaven. I do not deserve the grace that you have given or the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder at the sacrifice you made. With mercy beyond measure, my debt you freely paid. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches. Stars in the sky. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds.